on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. This is a business at the end of the day. I write with the concept of if I don't get this book written and I don't get this thing ready to go, I'm going to be homeless in my car with my kids at the end of the month, and that's all the motivation I need to make sure that doesn't happen. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show. It's Friday, it's James, and it's... Victor Meldrew. Victor Meldrew. So I should say, before before we uh, launch into the podcast, James, I just logged on to the uh, our little Zoom chat and... Uh, James, well, I won't say, I won't repeat what James said because it was very rude and it may have involved swear words and um, I don't want to upset any children who might be listening. But we just got a comment on on the uh, uh, the, the YouTube channel from last week's episode with uh, Johnny from uh, the Self Publishing Podcast, um, and it's one of it's one of our favourites, isn't it, James? So it's a Mr. Yes. Mac Mac Bizzo, which is clearly Hello, a made Mac. up clearly a made up name. Uh, by the way, Mac, if you're if you're watching this, the interview won't start for quite some time, so. <laughs> Well, we did 13 minutes that Mac didn't appreciate. So read out his comment. Read his comment. I, Mark. Come on, let's, I will, let's, yes. Let's he, has it. He, he has edited it. So he's obviously spent some time thinking about this. But he's weirdly, he's not edited it very well. So data cost money. Costs money, perhaps, Mac? Um, not, gra- grammar, is, grammar and syntax is free. Um, da- data cost money. A 13-min intro. Let's get to the point, please. Starts at 22 minutes. So uh, thanks for that, Mac. That's uh, we, we appreciate all comments. James... James replied, and unfortunately, it comes up with with my my face next to the yes. comment. So James, it was James, and not me who said this. But then James would have been more is more polite than I would have been. Really, stop! Please stop listening to us and find someone else's podcast to com- complain about, or better still, start your own. I agree, absolutely. Yeah, Max should start his own, and we're going to comment on it every week. Seriously, we, Mac, that cost me 0.0006 pence of yes. bandwidth. Listening Data to those is very minutes. expensive, isn't it? Very Data expensive. is expensive. So anyway, well, yeah, there we go. That's a, so we, we we like to start our podcast by insulting our audience, but then you know yes. he did he did fire the first shot. We could have <laughs> another did. Christopher Peterson on our hands. Thing is, if we um if we if we carry on for twenty minutes in this rambling intro, Mac won't eat this weekend. That's how much he well, would have spent on data listening to us. That is true. I th- actually, I think what we should do next week is pretend that we've got like an amazing interview. Like it's someone J.K. Rowling's coming on, and yes. we should just banter for sixty minutes and then yes. say, "Oh, it'll oh. be next week." We haven't got. So- we'll say we haven't got time for the interview now. Um, when are we getting J.K. Rowling on? Well, on? look, she she's very busy. She is so. right. What's she doing anyway? Um, I need to welcome our Patreon supporters. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this week. Lauren McNeil from Stadhampton in the UK. Do you know, I do not know where Stadhampton is. Do you know where Stadhampton mm, is? I don't know. Not you one on me. Uh, Juliet Fisher from Tasmania, a Taswegian. I know uh, where Tasmania is. Uh, Michael Kuhn, Richard Sayer, Dixon Reul. I think I said that right. Welcome all of you to uh, the self-publishing formula podcast or the self-publishing show as we are now. You missed one. Um, uh, Mac Bizzo. Mac Bizzo has joined us. He's going to donate. <laughs> I, he's, no, he needs his money for data. He, he does. Yeah, he does. Bless him. Money is data. Data is money. Right. Okay. Um, well, yes, we had Johnny B. Truant last week and uh, it went down very well and uh, sparked some interest. Great to talk to him. And today we have a very... Sorry. What were you going to yeah, say? I was going to say, hold on. I, I rudely interrupted you as you were uh, thanking our Patreon. So I, I will do that. So thank you very much for supporting the podcast. It means a lot to us um, and it kind of uh, evens out the... Uh, well, trolls on the one hand, as it clowns yeah. to the left of me, yeah. jokers on the right, yeah, yeah, yeah. and patron supporters in the middle. So, thank you very much. Is that Steeler's Wheel? Something like it that. is Steeler's Wheel, yes. Yeah. We had uh, we have thousands of listeners, uh, five figures at least of listeners uh, every week to this podcast, and most people enjoy it and uh, and either say so, and occasionally somebody says that. The ones anyway. who don't, the ones who don't enjoy it, are usually polite enough not to say anything. Yes, but not Matt. Well, he's running short of cash. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's actually he's actually spent a bit of money by sending that comment. So he really needs to think about yes. think about things, he's, Matt. Mac it's priorities, Mac. You know, if you want a Big Mac this weekend, Mac, you need to. Oh need dear. To save. dear, I, dear. I'm getting a free Big Mac next weekend because I we went to McDonald's last night and uh, they delivered the wrong burger, and my son went back to the counter and said, "Oh, the wrong burger." And then they came with this really complicated bit of paperwork that involved me signing something, coming up with a pin 
taking a photograph of it, which means when we go back next time and speak to the manager and quote all these references, we get a free Big Mac. You got it. The way I look at these things is how much time. How much is my time worth? Is it yeah. was it worth a burger <laughs> to fill that format? Pro- it was probably not. not. Absolutely, it wasn't. Definitely wasn't worth Big Mac's time. Whoever owns McDonald's. Um, <clears throat> okay, now we genuinely are rambling. Now, look, we've got a good interview today with a guy called James Rosson, who has had uh, lived more life in his life so far than most of us will do in the whole of our lives uh but very interesting indeed to talk to him he's got a good story also about getting your marketing right and paying the price when you make mistakes and how you recover from that so all that's come in just a few minutes about 16. Um, before then, I am going to mention that you've got probably one last chance and a little week or 10 days or so to get yourself on the wait list for our live conference when we resell the tickets that we've held back a bit. Uh, if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPS live wait list, you can join that list. Um, and Mark, I think one little topic of conversation we're going to have before we go into the interview with James is uh, you've been posting a little bit about your experiences in Germany. Um, you've invaded Germany with oh some. God, so, I, I could have set my watch to that. I, I was just success. thinking to myself, what's he going to say about Germany? And and as if by magic, within like five seconds of that thought crossing my mind, there's a it's joke like, about in, invading Germany. It's like, honestly, it's, a, it's like a blitzkrieg as you, as yeah, you God. storm you are. as you st- storm the German front. You, um, I, I want. I sometimes wonder if you've achieved peak partridge, and 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 every week you demonstrate well, that you haven't. The only- the only thing I'd say, Mark, is don't open up a Russian front because if you if you concentrate too much time and effort on on Can, that side of things, I think God. you're going to lose lose your main battle. Oh, but anyway, um, the important thing is we've all moved on, and uh, <laughs> apologies to our, our German friends, Mark, and we haven't got any German friends anymore. <laughs> we had lots, but now we do don't. You think, do you think Max of German descent, and he's now fuming? Um, <laughs> Anyway, let's talk seriously about Germany because you're killing it. And no, that was not a reference. <laughs> it wasn't supposed to um, be. Right, no. Um, yes, I suppose I'm, I'm doing quite well now. So, um, yeah, I've been talking about it for a little while. Um, I had three books, my three Beatrix Rose books I had translated um, about start of last year and into like February and March. Launched them um, when they were ready. So they kind of all went live between March and April, I think. And they did quite well. Um, I, I put some Facebook ads towards them. I used a few Amazon ads and they did pretty well. I I, I have to figure out, um, I may have a look later on and tell you what I made in terms of German income last year. We'll, we'll cover that if we do the review of 2019 as we've been threatening. Um, but then I had I'd sold enough to think, okay, it's worth, it's worth doing the Milton book. So I then got those translated as well. Um, or I got the first two translated. I got one, two and four translated with three coming out in about a month and then I bought three back from my German publishers um, so I had I have six in total and with five of them live right now um, it's just kind of gone it's gone a bit crazy which is is obviously um, very pleasing but the uh, the book the first book in the series the cleaner uh, so it's the cleaner in in the UK and der cleaner in uh, in Germany and I look at my book report most well you know all, all of the time and uh, Der Cleaner is outselling The Cleaner. So if you think about that, The Cleaner is is selling in the US, the UK markets, the two biggest markets in English. And the German version is outselling both of them combined, which is, is really f- great. Um, in- income is, is, you can see the read through flowing in. So book two is selling very strongly. Um, book three is not out yet, but people are going straight to book four. So it's just going really, really well. And the, the last three or four... So, so book four's out, but book three's not. Yeah, book three, I decided to put them up anyway, but book three is is being translated and will be ready in about two weeks. So I'll then have all six out, the first six. Remember, there's 16, I think, in the series now, so I've got more to, to go. But it's doing about 300 euros a day at the moment. And I thought in my head, it was I was pretty sure that Amazon had put the first one up for prime reading in Germany. So I just, um, I emailed the German team and said, um, I can't remember is which one of these has been, is being promoted. And they were like, um, none of them are being promoted. Um, so, which was about the, the best answer I could have got because that, um, you know, I haven't even switched on the advertising onto those books yet. So wow. this is all organic. I don't really know why this series is doing much, much better than the Beatrix series, apart from the fact that I've sold many more copies of that series worldwide. Um, maybe people were waiting for them. I don't, I don't know. That kind of seems a little bit presumptuous to suggest that. But something is clearly 
is happening and it's it, they're selling strongly and and picking up momentum so you know the, the the first in the series is doing better day on day so um at the moment you know it's looking 300 euros a day over the course of a year is 100,000 euros um so yeah. that's not to Fantastic. be stiffed up so really pleased no. about that and I saw when you posted into the comments that um, I think it's Cecilia said that she was mm. doing well in Germany as well. So presumably mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't read too much uh, further on at that point because I'm busy man, Mac. Um, but I assume she hasn't translated her book. So she's selling English language. In no, Germany. I think she has got some translations out. So we, we have oh, okay. a very small kind of application only. So don't please don't flood me with applications for this. We have a very small German marketing group, uh, which I, is kind of by invitation only. So th- I've got... Um, a couple of authors in there who are kind of selling at super, super, super levels in Germany, husband and wife team. Um, maybe I'll see if we can get them on the podcast at, at, at some point, but they're, they're selling really, really well. Um, and so we're talking about that. Cecilia is in that as well. Um, and I mean, some of the other things that are kind of encouraging is I haven't hit a Kindle All-Star bonus yet in Germany. So even at that level, so doing 300 euros a day, um, I'm I'm not hitting the bottom rung of the author bonus. I think I know where that is from speaking to others, and I think I might hit it this month. Um, but with the, they're in KU, so with those KU page reads, um, I'm, I'm not even in the top. I don't. I'm not quite sure what the what the rankings are in Germany, but certainly not the top ten authors. Probably not the top fifty authors. Which just goes to show there's there's a lot more scope for growth um, in that market. And what do you think about marketing English language books in Germany? It's really it? difficult. Um, and mm. the the main thing is I don't speak German. Um, so And I'm not prepared to use Google Translate to, to write ad copy because it's it's good, but it's not mm. it's not perfect. So I will use it now and again with an apology to... I'm getting emails from German readers now in German saying that they don't speak English. And I'm like, ah, that's a shame because I don't speak German. So you can yeah. run the replies through Translate. And I think they'll be legible, but I wouldn't want to use those on ad copy because if you get that wrong, then... You're not going to have a very compelling ad, so that's the main thing. Is is getting? Um, I can't be as nimble as I am in English language ads because I, I have to go to a translator to get my copy translated, which is a pain. Sure. But you know, that's that's just that's the the main problem. Um, but it's not outweighed by the fact that you know, there's well, it is outweighed by the fact that there's just tons and tons of potential in that market. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's exciting. I mean, and, you know, markets are only going to become more accessible as time goes on. So mm-hmm. I wonder what country we'll be talking about this time next year if you've... Uh... Probably France or Spain, I would have thought. Yeah. I've, I've probably France. I, we've got a couple of people. I also have a French marketing group um, mm. with a couple of... of um, a couple of uh, indies doing very well caroline and alex who will probably be listening are doing really well in uh in france There's lots of different things that are, are relevant there i mean caroline um did very well in december with print books i, I put a slightly come humble bragging um screen grab from one of my acos <coughs> accounts one of so one of my um, amazon ads accounts where I'd, i think i'd spent 50 cents and made 30 dollars um on that ad and and then she retorted with um a something that her a cost was like 2.79 percent and she made it was in it was in the you know for a good four to even maybe low five figure um return and it was just french print books and apparently right. and i don't obviously i don't know this i'm not french i don't understand the french book market i don't speak french particularly well either but she said um the french markets are prepared to pay quite highly for paperbacks so she was charging 19.99 for wow. these paperbacks and was just making a killing. I mean, absolutely making a killing. These were these are KDP uh, print print on demand books um, that she was selling around about Christmas time. They're not Christmas themed, from what I can make out. They are just kind of I think they're maybe kind of slightly fantastical um, and mm. um, just absolutely crushing it with with and, um, and Amazon ads. Do you think there's space here for agencies to start up providing services to indies? Um, the oh top yeah, sort of services you've bought to you know, one stop yeah. shop really to yeah. get translations done and ad copy and. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if I had, if I could clone myself, um, I would have an ad agency on the one hand offering for kind of a full service advertising solution to indies and, and translation would be in there as well. And it's absolutely, um, the comics as well, actually comics is another one. I mean, we, we will talk about this later, but the uh, comic book adaptation of my Beatrix series is coming on, on well. And I think my brother might right. be in a position to Kind of, he's project managing that for me. He might be in a position to offer that service to other people who want to get into comics. There's mm. tons of things, loads and loads of things that you, you can look into. But um, yeah, certainly those agencies would, would be something that I would do. But, you know, can't do it. Just don't have time. No. 
Brilliant. Well, well done on that success. Good to hear. And we'll uh, keep track of that. We must do that 2019 episode. So maybe we could um, find some time in the next seven days uh, to record that for next week. We'll um, no guarantees, but that's what we'll aim for. Um, it is it is busy time at the moment. Uh, OK, look, let's go on with the interview. We can have a chat off the back of that. Uh, we are just good. checking 14 oh. minutes 50 for those. Yeah, who well, are... we've lost Mac. He's gone. He's oh, gone. Yes. He can't, his, me- <laughs> his meter's run out. It's got, he's currently trying to put coins in. It's credit now. You buy a little credit on the machine, on the card, don't you? Put it back, sitting in the dark. Um, anyway, uh, let's talk to uh, James Rossone, uh, who uh, we met, I think, the first time in London. I think he walked up to us at London Book Fair a couple of years ago. We met him around the place mm, yes, since, it was. since then. Um, and uh, you'll find out from the interview that Mac... Uh, Mac got Mac on the brain, uh, that James served his country um, uh, in some fairly serious situations, has not come away from that unscarred. Uh, writing is part of the way that he's dealing with that, but he's become uh, very successful at it and uh, a great lesson, I think, in this interview where he talks about, in particular, making a mistake that costs a lot of money and recovering from that. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. James. Welcome to the self-publishing show. We actually spoke to you in London, but it's been a mystery to all of us as to where that interview's gone. It's buried somewhere on a hard drive, but it's never going to see the light of day, I don't think. But um, we had a good chat in London. We've met several times since, and uh, a fascinating story. So you better give us the um, give the uh, the show listeners the skinny on who James or Sony is. Sure. So when I joined the military, uh, I originally joined the army, and then I made the mistake of thinking, oh, let's go Air Force, right? So when I joined the Air Force, I go in as a human intelligence collector, which is a, an interrogator, essentially. But my job was actually working as a, a, as a legitimate terrorist hunter. So we were hunting these, these terrorists all over the Middle East. And then uh, when I got out of the military, went to work on the civilian side, uh, essentially continued that same job. But this time I was in Europe, so mostly focused in uh, Southern Europe, the Balkans, uh, Eurasia, um, and just moving all over like that. So uh, obviously I use a pen name because, um, you know, there's bona fide legitimate bad dudes who really don't like me. Uh, so I like using the pen name. And it's really nice to be able to separate your real life from your business. Sure. Your author, because I think that's important to be able to distinguish the two. Yeah, that's a very good reason for doing that. So to give us an idea of the sort of world that you used to live in, which must feel like a a universe away from your day-to-day life now but uh, a lot of us have seen Zero Dark Thirty and at the beginning of that film there's quite a focus on what I think you what did you call it? information retrieval it was that from Brazil Bruce. yeah something like that quite a focus on what some people would describe as torture and other people describe yeah. as as uh, interview techniques is that the sort of thing without going perhaps into no not what I did no okay. that they were CIA so they were a special case um, I like to think we were actually much better at it than they were to be honest um, we had 1260 hours of training before we ever talked to someone wow or as one of their interrogators might get a couple hundred hours at best uh, so ours was distinctly different. I wrote my my first book. I wrote uh, was originally with a trad pub called uh, Dinner with the Terrorists. We eventually recovered the rights to that and republished it as Interview with the Terrorists. And we really talk about what it's like to be an interrogator because, to be honest with you, it's it's much more about conversations, um, talking with them, uh, trying to find those connection points that you have and they have. Because this guy is maybe an absolute heinous you know, mm. person, but at the end of the day, he's still a human and he still has human connections and contacts and points of interest. So you've got to circle around and find those points of interest and commonality and be able to establish some sort of bridge where you two can talk and, you know, get them to give up the goods. I mean, it's fortunate interrogating, you know, Arabs, they are chatty people and they love to talk. And, and fortunately they love to gossip. Now they won't talk about themselves, but they'll gladly talk about everyone else. So I would just say, well, look, you know, obviously there's a mistake you're here. So let's talk about the, who are the bad people in your your neighborhood. And that gives him an out to dish on everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> and for me, and, that's just as valuable. Sounds, sounds like a good technique. And, and all the while, there's a time pressure because you've got a real world situation with soldiers' boots on the ground. And you don't want them walking into a trap. Um, Correct. Yeah, so I guess all that, that bears down on you. Yeah, we had a lot of, I mean, I hate to say it, but we had a lot of that. Um, you know, 
in my my long deployment, I was gone 556 days. Not that I was counting. Um, well, you were gone but, continuously for that. Yeah, it was a long wow, trip. Wow, that was a long tour. <laughs> that was hard. I hear these sailors complaining about three months, but that was. <laughs> oh no, that's that was rough. That was rough. So yeah, I saw my wife 26 days in that whole period, wow. or 28 days in that whole period. So you know, but it, it, it it's challenging. You know, you you collect the information, you provide it to the units, you hope that they exploit the information correctly and and go after it. You know, you'll provide warnings. Sometimes they heed them. Sometimes they don't. You know, we had a. We had a, a new battalion arrive in Bakuba and Diyala province that I specialized in. And uh, they'd only been in country for like a week or two. And they decided not to heed one of our warnings. You know, they were wanting to move to contact. And uh, they ended up going right into two different ambushes that we warned them about. And that was te- that was a rough day. You know, we had yeah. six Americans killed and more than a dozen injured on that day. And it's like, I, we got the information. We told you exactly where the where the attack was going to happen. And lo and behold, it happened exactly where we said it was. Yeah. Uh, so you have days like that. But at the other point, you have days where you have these exciting, exhilarating moments. You know, we had one guy who was a really big wig in, uh, in Al-Qaeda. And we, we managed to track his phone. And he was on the phone talking. And they had a drone up over Baghdad. And they found out exactly where he is. And then they sent a, a Delta team was on deck for that mission. So they go out. And you're watching this, and this guy is like hanging out of this helicopter with a long rifle, fires a couple of rounds into this, the hood of this car. It stops. The, he- the Blackhawk starts hovering down, and these three guys just like jump out of there on ropes, land down there, run over, grab the dude, yank him out of the car, put him on the ground, put a hoodie over him, a zip tie on him. And it's time the helicopter's now landed in the center of the traffic circle. They run over, throw him on the helicopter, and he's gone. Wow. And, you know, you video the whole thing. And then, you know, three, four hours later, you're sitting here talking to him. Yeah. I mean, that's really kind of a cool job. A senior guy who can give up lots of uh, useful stuff that's going to hopefully save lives. Um, Yeah. And the other thing to say is not to get on the wrong side of you because you've got, uh, you know, one phone call as suddenly there's a black hawk over my head and uh, I'm on the way out. Um, Yeah. Now, Josh, joking aside, and I know you've talked about this publicly and you post about this, uh, I think it's fair to say that you and a, a lot of your colleagues, but you speaking personally, have not come away from that experience unscarred. No, it, it, it's tough because you go from this high octane adrenaline job where you have, you know, the ultimate mission in the world. And then you walk away from that and you suddenly have no mission. You know, you've spent most of your adult life that this is what you do. And now that it's gone, and it's like, well, now what? Because there's nothing going to replace that, that kind of adrenaline rush, that tip of the spear, nothing replaces that. And that's very hard to, to handle and accept, you know, going back to being Joe Nobody. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of, that's why a lot of veterans struggle with PTSD when they come home is because they, they had a mission, and now their mission's gone. And unless they can find a new mission, a new purpose, uh, they just kind of flounder. And that's where, you know, a lot of guys end up running into problems and trouble. Yeah. And how do you think uh, the United States is coping with that? I and mean, there's a reasonable amount of um, concern about not enough is being done in the UK. Is that the same in the US? Yeah, I think part of the challenge is, is in, our, <clears throat> in our problem is our guys have been deployed so much. So it's not that we've gone over one time. Many guys have been over three, four, five times. And I spent three and a half years in Iraq. That's a long time. Um, that's longer than most servicemen spent in World War II or in Vietnam. And so the challenge is a lot of guys have been over there and spent so many years in these different environments. It's hard for them to come back down and reassimilate because a, a really good job equivalent for a lot of those types of things that we did here in the civilian world. So you come down to what do I do next? And that's really hard to adjust to. Yeah. But you have found something to do next. You started writing. I did. I, did. I started writing. So originally, um, one of my VA counselors told me, you know, you should do writing, it's good therapy, writing therapy. So I, I, I started doing that. And that's when I first published my, my first book. And then I didn't touch it and do anything more in publishing for probably five years. Um, it just didn't work out well with this trad pub. They didn't market it. They didn't do much. didn't make any money off of it. Um, and then we decided to, you know, get the rights back and republish it and rebrand and then just move forward with our own stuff. And I'm an avid reader. I like to read. I was reading probably four to six books a month because my, I was on a plane traveling a lot of different countries. 
And I started looking at this as like, man, I could write just as good or better than most of these books I'm reading. I know the inside skinny of what's going on in half these types of stories. So that's when I started crafting my own stories, my own universes, my own worlds, and creating my own my own version of things. Yeah. And uh, you've become quite prolific. And we should have a little advert for Mr. Dawson and his teaching, because I think that was a bit of a breakthrough mm -hmm. moment for you. Just tell us about that. Yeah, it was. I mean, I was... I didn't know squat about mark, digital marketing. Everything I learned was off of YouTube, essentially. Uh, and then I, I, I discovered Mark Dawson's course. And our first year of writing, we did pretty good. I would say our first, probably first 15 months of independent self-publishing, we did, we, we generated probably around 40 grand. So we were doing pretty decent, but we didn't know what we were doing. And mind you, I didn't, I was working full time. So I was using all that money to just plow back into marketing to build up the name and brand and everything. But when we learned about Mark Dawson's course, my wife and I sat through it. We looked at all this and it just clicked. It just made sense. So then we just started ruthlessly employing every tactic we could when it came to the digital marketing side. When it came to developing ad copy, it was really big, getting the right covers, um, putting all of these things together, and then just start hammering it home, you know, writing to market, understanding your genre, professionalizing it. Because our first 18 months, it wasn't professional. It was very on the fly, trying to figure it out. But now it's a full-blown professional business, and we really treat it like a business. You know, so I would say like our first... Well, like I say, when we, we started the SPF program, uh, we had made $40,500. From that point going forward, we've obviously published a few more books and series, but we've employed everything that Mark's talked, talked about. So since then, we've generated, what, since October of 2017, so we're coming up on a little over two years now, you know, an additional $538,000 in revenue. Wow. Um, that's purely from just following exactly what Mark talks about. We really, really said, okay, what do we do? How do we make it ours? And how do we double down and triple down on certain parts of it? Well, oh, congratulations. That's a really great success story. And in terms of, we were talking a little bit off air about this. I think in terms of the secret, um, and it's not really a secret, it's knuckling down at, and, and doing the, doing the instruction, following it, and then, you know, really getting into the details here. It's not, you know, there's no magic bullet, right? There's no sweep of a it's wand. Hard work. It's hard this work. This is hard work. It's like any other business, any other tech business, whatever. It's it's hard work. And you've got to be willing to put the time and the effort into it. And it's not just sitting down and listening to Mark's course once. So I've sat down and listened to it, you know, an hour a day intermittently. Or what we'll do is my wife and I will go back every quarter or anytime there's an update. And we'll re-watch it. We'll re-listen to it because uh, things change, things evolve. You've got to constantly be testing. Um, and you've got to constantly be adapting to the changes that are happening. And then it's just talking amongst yourself with your your fellow colleagues and finding out what's working, what's not working. Because there's little there's little hacks to EMS and how to make EMS better. I mean, heck, I hired a one of our one of our friends from church. You know, I hired their their. Um, son's a senior in, in high school. So I teach, I taught him how to do keyword uh, creations and things for our books, going through the also bots, going three layers deep and also bots, going to the top 100 in your genre, going, you know, going three layers deep and all of those. And, you know, I paid him, I think it was like almost $500. And he created a 5,000 word keyword spreadsheet for me. And so Amazon allows you to put a uh, thousand keywords per, uh, per, you know, ad. So I'll have, uh, I break them down usually into about three to 500 keyword chunks and I'll run all these different ads and I'll test them all. And it may take me three months to run through it and a few thousand dollars, but I'll eventually find out which keywords are the highest return on, on investment. And then I'll put all of those into one super ad. And then we just really, you know, hit that 60, $80 a day on that super ad. And that system has worked. That's given you an optimized campaign in the end. It does. It does. Because in part of it is you, you got to understand what is your true ACOS. So for the longest time, I was like, man, my ACOS is over 120%. I'm losing money. Well, that's because I was an idiot and didn't understand how it really worked. Uh, so then I, I, I signed up to uh, readerlinks.com and really started plugging in what my, uh, my, my revenues were, what my costs were. And that gave me a true ACOS. So I have a series 
where my ACOS is actually 440%. Th that's because it has a high read-through ratio, and it's $5.99 for a six-book series. And each book is $5.99. So when, that, when I found out my ACOS is actually 440%, I could run an ad where I'm hitting 250% ACOS and I'm making money. I'm making really good money. And I didn't realize that at first. So now I'm like, okay, let me go ahead, double or triple up on that ad and continue to crank it out. Because I was thinking, wow, I'm getting 200 some percent ACOS, I'm, I'm losing money. But the fact was, I was leaving a lot of money on the table by pairing that back or not doubling down on that. Yeah. And once you figure that out, it opens up your revenue streams a lot. Yeah, understanding read through and understanding when a um, when a campaign is working for you, it's not necessarily at face value as you very important. Right. You say um, just a small technical point then. So I know you you mentioned how many keywords you run, and yeah, as you say, Amazon Ads allows you to put a thousand in, and actually in their little notes, if you click on it, rec not, recommends you put a thousand in. But most people don't, and I noticed that you don't put a thousand in. I don't because the problem is if you put a thousand keywords and I've done this, I've tested this for months. Okay. The problem is when you put a thousand keywords in there, you're not going to get enough. Um, there's not enough money to run through and test a thousand keywords. Um, so that can be very frustrating. It took me a couple months to figure that piece out because you're going to have to charge, you know, 40 cents or even 60 or 70 cents a click. Uh, across them all just to start getting some data and get some ad spend. And then you're going to have to put a budget of like 40 or $50 a day so it has money to start testing it. So I found if you broke it down to between three and 500 keyword chunks, you it, it's small enough, but it's large enough to test a bunch of words, but it's still small enough to actually run through those words. And then when you start figuring out what words are uh, charging you a fortune and returning nothing, you start closing them off. And then you go to your your master Excel sheet and you redline that keyword. And then the words that are returning a lot of money, you go in and you uh, put a, you know a blue line on your master sheet. This is a good keyword. And then over time, you start migrating all your good keywords to a super ad. And then you've got an ad that's got three or five hundred keywords in it that are rock star keywords for you. And that's the ad you make that six or seventy dollars a day anywhere from 40 to 90 cents a keyword. So it depends. Some keywords I can get away with 30 and 40, 40 cents. Some keywords I will pay uh, 90 cents or even a dollar keyword because like for instance, my own, like I got to advertise defensive advertise James Rizone of all things. And so my keywords sometimes range anywhere from a dollar 18 to a dollar 80 sometimes. So I will always unfortunately have to pay that to defend my own, yeah. my own keyword. Um, but it, it's, it's a lot of trial and error and just testing, a real lot of testing. Do you find people are targeting you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And sometimes it, it's just it's like anything. As soon as people find out you're, you're moder moderately successful, they're going to try to target your stuff and go after it. So I get some really weird books being targeted against me that have nothing to do with my genre whatsoever. Um, wow. And that's just kind of odd that people are doing that. Uh, it's, and it goes back to understanding – what is your genre? What are the books in your genre? What are the successful authors in your genre? And making sure that you're targeting the right group. Because someone who's targeting me, who doesn't write anything near what I write, they're just wasting money on this on this ad because they're not reaching the right audience. They're not reaching the audience that's going to be receptive to their book. You know, again, that goes back to what Mark talks about. Yeah. You got to know the audience and you got to target the right audience or you're going to waste a lot of marketing dollars. Yeah, absolutely. And talking of wasting, I mean, some of it's wasted and some of it's a learning experience. That's one of the things I think that we're going to talk about is is making mistakes, learning oh, and recovering. Mean. And yes, yeah, you've made a few, but like uh, Frank Sinatra, but you've um, got no regrets because ultimately it's led to where you are. Yeah, I mean, I, I've done that, but I'll tell you what, if I hadn't, if someone could have told me some of these things in advance, they would have saved me a lot of problems. And I would have made a lot more money had I known certain things in advance. You know, when I first got into writing, I didn't realize I needed to create an author website, a reader magnet, an email list. My first year I was writing, I didn't even have an email list. Um, and now I've got one. And even my email list is very, it's very small, but it's 100% organically grown. I don't do reader magnets. I don't do free books to give away to, to join my mailing list, things like that. All people who join my list join organically from my back matter. 
um, and or, or through my Facebook stuff. And they join because they legitimately want to be there, which helps because I have a very high open rate. My open rate is typically 65% or better. My click-through ratio on these things is usually above 25, 30%. So when I send out an email, I can almost without fail generate, you know, three, three hundred to twelve hundred dollars on a single email. So that's very helpful. That's really good. Um, what are the biggest mistakes you've made, perhaps in terms of cost? Oh man, I'll tell you. In terms of costs, my biggest mistake was probably not professionalizing the the um, the the book covers right away. That was probably my biggest mistake. Uh, I used Fiverr.com, and it's not that it's not not good. And there's certainly ways to make it better, but I I failed to I failed to get on board with doing that right away. I made the problem the mistake of getting wedded to the wrong types of covers for my genre or the wrong types of covers for my my series, and that just kind of hurt me in the long run. I think it had I had better book covers from the get go, I think my stuff would have been substantially better. And then ad copy. You know, we're, we're writers. We like to tell stories. We like to put too much stuff in our ads. And that doesn't make for a good copy. And I didn't, I, those were my two biggest downfalls right there. Yeah. Um, let's talk about pre-ordering. Because didn't you make a, a mistake? I make a fortune on pre-orders. Yeah. I mean, I also made a huge mistake in yes. pre-orders. So I think <laughs> that's what I'm getting. Because I seem to remember you once said you lost about $50,000, you reckoned. What, so tell Easy. us about that. What happened there? Ah, oh, all right. So I had this series, my Red Storm series was just crushing it, killing it. We're hitting 3,600 plus pre-orders on a 90-day window. Um, so that thing is just killing it for us. What I failed to do, though, was I had another series that I was working on. And my idea was, oh, I'll just write this thing. I'll write all these books in advance. and I'll just release them a month apart. Well, in doing that, it took me time to build this up. So I didn't... I didn't um, have the, the new pre-order ready when when the end of our other series happened. So when people finish reading book six, they could look and go, oh, James has got another book ready to go. Let me go ahead and pre-order it like they've been doing for the last 18 months. I didn't do that. I, I waited 60 whole days before I put the next pre-order up. So when that happened, I had 30 some thousand people borrow and read and buy book six and those people didn't have a a hyperlink for book one to go to so i lost out on being able to one sell to those people and now i have to retarget and find those people which is very challenging and difficult to do and expensive so that mistake, it's more advertising and it's expensive it cost me a fortune to have to retarget remarket it go after it and i really screw the pooch on that one and then I compounded the mistake even worse by picking, by getting wedded to the wrong book covers for the first two books and not having the right type of a series name. So I've made a very concerted effort to build an international audience. And over time, that audience has wavered between 30 and 40% international. So I picked a series title that may be apt to what I'm writing about, but it doesn't reach an international audience. And then I picked the wrong book covers. My book covers were originally more for uh, not read more like nonfiction as opposed to fiction. They're cool covers. Everyone liked it. My readers thought this was a great cover. The problem is the marketplace didn't think it was a good cover. And so the sales were abysmal for the for this the book one. The pre-orders for book one were abysmal. The sales for it were abysmal. The pre-orders for book two were abysmal. I finally wised up and said, something's wrong. What is it? Let's try to see if we can save the series and fix us. So we went into Amazon. We changed the series name. Kept the same names of the books. We changed the series name. And then we did redid the copy. And we got brand new covers that read for the genre we were in. And those things have been killing it ever since. Uh, as soon as we made that change, it was probably about a four or 500% increase in sales of book one. And then an 86% read through from book one to two and book three just came out and it's about a 78% read through from book two to book three. So we're maintaining that high read through, uh, but that was a huge mistake. That was a costly mistake that cost us at least 50,000 or more dollars this year by having, not having the pre-order ready at the end of the series and not having the right book covers. 
And that's that about, would be my big thing. Don't do it. Yeah, don't do that one. And that's that's about planning, but it's also about work rate because you've got to be at your desk every day, making sure yep. that your books are being written and edited in the in the production line. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will have that month sixty days gap. Correct. So I, I mean, I'm a bit of a workaholic. So my jobs in the past have always had me working, you know, twelve on, twelve off, mostly seven days a week. So I'm kind of used to that kind of schedule at this point because I'm, I'm 41. I've been doing that for 20 odd years. So for me, it's not a, a problem to sit and work, you know, to literally sit and write eight or 12 or, or 15 hours sometimes. Now there's days I don't do any writing for like one or two days, but I'm always going to sit, find some time to sit down and just hunker down for a while. So yesterday, you know, I was able to carve out eight solid hours, wrote 9,000 words yesterday. Uh, on on Sunday, I was able to carve out, I think it was maybe nine hours that day and managed to knock out 13,000. So I was able to get a lot done in the last four days. But I'll tell you, the previous week, I didn't get hardly anything. In this coming week, I probably won't get much either because I've got family in town for the holidays. So part of it is saying, okay, what does the work kind of have to hit? And then just really just knuckle down and do it. If it means staying up till midnight or one in the morning, and getting up at five. And that's what you just got to do. This is a business at the end of the day. And I write with the concept of if I don't get this book written and I don't get this thing ready to go, I'm going to be homeless in my car with my kids at the end of the month. And that's all the motivation I need to make sure that doesn't happen. And you write, you write scared, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, and just talk, tell us a little bit about your writing process, uh, James. How do you write? Where do you write? And how much do you write? Sure. So when I write... When I come up with a series, I usually have a start point and an end point. Now, how I get in there in between there is a little, uh, you know, in flux, so to speak. So I'll tend to break it down by chapters, and then I'll put in usually two or three bullet points of what I think we should talk about in each chapter, and then I start filling it in. Now, it'll change and morph as a story unfolds, but that's kind of a loose outline. So I'm very much a pantser in a way in that regards. Um, you know, as to where I, how I write, you know, usually I get back from dropping the kids off from school about 7.30. So I start doing social media and emails from usually about 8 o'clock to about 9. And then from 9 to maybe 2 o'clock, I try to get in as much writing as I can. And then I pick back up again with the writing maybe a couple hours in the afternoon, depending upon my kids' schedule. And then I start again after 8 o'clock when they go to bed from usually 8 to 11 or 8 till midnight. Right. So I've really cut out non-essentials, you know, yeah. very seldom do I binge or watch on a TV series once in a blue moon, I will. Um, but it's, this is a business. And I know that if I work my butt off for the next, you know, four or five years in this business and I build a portfolio of 30 or 40 really good thrillers, really good books, and then I have 30 or 40 audibles with it, I'm going to create a good monthly stream of income constantly coming in and that's important to you know your long-term financial survivability i mean that's a lot of writing every day well it is but you know it, it it is a business i mean at the end of the day like mark says this is a business you're creating a product and so we i write five books a year we publish four books a year uh, my wife co-writes with me and so it's very much an assembly line i finish the book I hand it off to my wife and she goes in and adds in her pieces to it, her flair, make sure everything flows together. Then she looks at her cheat sheet from our editor of common mistakes that we make. And she goes through and control finds, finds them all, fixes them all. Then she sends it off to the editor. Well, by the time that happens, I'm done with book two. So I hand book two off to her, book one's at the editor, book two's with her, and I'm starting book three. So it's an assembly line cycle. And we've gotten to a point now where, uh, she's editing book four of our current series. Book five is already done. Book one of the new series is already done. And I'm halfway done with book two of the new series. And so it, it is a cycle, but it's important to maintain that. Um, before Amazon was very sticklers about having that 90 day window. So we were always stuck in the 90 day perpetual cycle. Now that they've changed that, it has opened things up for us to perhaps spread that out a little bit. But we find that when you want to maintain really good read through, You've got to you've got to kind of close the door within that ninety day window. Uh, and how how do you write? You write in Scrivener or Word or? 
Well, I write in Word. Um, I've tried Scrivener a couple of times. Maybe I need to just spend a few hours on their tutorial and a few other things like that. But for me, uh, I, I like using uh, Word and then I'll have Grammarly opened right next to it. So I'm kind of writing and editing, so to speak, at the same time. Um, and then that just for me helps helps speed things up a little faster. I have a separate Word doc that's got like characters and scenes and different things in it. And then I've got my main Word document that I'm writing in chapters. Okay, excellent. Well, your covers look great, James. I was just having a look at them. Um, I should say, yeah, you you co-write. Your wife is also the um, is credited on the covers. Miranda Watson. Yep. Yep. Uh, I mean, she. It's funny because she at first didn't want to have any listing whatsoever. I said no. I was like, look, you're spending just as much time editing these things as I am writing them. You should get some credit for this. Uh, so she came up with her name, and we put it on there. And then, uh, you know. Four years later, she's very happy that she has it because she's got, you know, 18 books to her name. Yeah. <laughs> well, the covers look great. Uh, fantastic kind of um, uh, thematically matching each other. Yep. So a very recognizable brand that you've come up with here. Um, yeah, that's key. That's key. It's creating that brand, a recognizable yeah. brand. That's what Mark's done. That's what a lot of other successful authors do. And it's very important to do that. Yeah. And uh, I noticed some World War II stuff as well. So I was going to ask you about uh, the genres that you write on, the subgenres. So your military thriller, I guess, is the is the big genre. Uh, a lot of it's contemporary, yep. which obviously matches your own experience in very recent years. Uh, and yep. then a bit of World War II as well. Well, working on some stuff like that. So right now what I've got is I've got a, a my first series was a you know, World War Three series, like a futuristic dystopian type thing. Um, it's. I don't think it's very good when I look at my current writing, but <laughs> it was our first foray. Then our second one was doing uh, the Red Storm series, which takes place in 2017. And then our current series, the uh, um, you know, Falling Empires takes place in uh, 2020 and 2021. So okay. very kind of current like that. Um, but it's, it's, it's unique and cool because you know, I've worked some really great jobs. You know, I was fortunate to work on the, uh, on the in, Intel staff for U.S. European Command and Special Operations Command. So, you know, when you get to work with these three and four star generals and admirals, you really kind of understand how the the big picture works, the strategy works. How do you how do you employ battalions, brigades, and divisions into combat? How do you handle replenishment and supplies and logistics and moving of these units? Um, all of that kind of information goes into our own books but we also integrate a lot of, of, of technology because wars of the future are not going to necessarily be fought with tanks uh, fighting tanks all the time there's going to be some of those skirmishes a lot of the fight is actually going to be information warfare with drones and cyber warfare uh, using social media and uh, for disinformation campaigns you know there's a, an enormous amount of technology that's going to be involved in future combat and future wars. But at the same point, you can't have all this techno stuff at, uh, at the stratosphere level. you got to get down and say, okay, well, let's write some stories about some sergeants and lieutenants who are having to fight these, you know, fire teams and platoon level combat. Uh, and so we do a really good job of showing that that individual fire team and platoon level combat combat inside of a tank and how that works because some of my beta readers are actual tankers mm. and so they help with writing the verbiage the, text, the terms used um and be able to craft those really good stories and that's one of the keys about having a great beta reader team and we've got about 90 people on our team at this point i broke them down into uh army navy marines air force then i've got uh british army you know british armed forces and australian armed forces so when i have scenes that are about those particular branches or groups those scenes get sent to those beta readers. And then those beta readers help to make sure that the terminology, the words used, the weapons involved, the slang that the soldiers use is all correct. And in that way, when it all comes together, it, it's really, really quite good. Great. So I should say it's World War Three. I was kept re I kept yeah. looking I kept looking at that box set thumbnail here and thought World War Two, but it's a World War Three. Um yeah. Great. I mean, that's there's a real trick, I think, to uh, to having the big picture and being able to write authentically at command mm -hmm. level and grunt level, uh, so yep. to speak. And I think Tom Clancy did it brilliantly. It was like the master of this. You, you Red Storm Rising and Hunt for Red October and so on. You were completely absorbed in the in the jet or in the tank or on the ground. Yep. And then on the other hand, at the Pentagon with the politicians, uh, he yep. seemed to have a reality about that. And I, it seems to be something you worked very hard at being in the room yeah. with whoever it is. But that's a lot of learning for you because your little bit of, when you're working in the military, 
the whole mm. point of your position is you have this this bit in front of you. You need to get absolutely right. You're linking the chain. You don't really have to concern yourself with either side of it too much, do you? Correct. Not too much. I mean, it depends on where you work. So, like when I was at U, U.S. European Command in, in in Germany, so you're on the when you're on the command staff there, you need to understand a bit of all those different facets and functions though too because when you're developing the the strategy so we had two primary missions our number one primary mission was defense of israel so then it's about well okay how do we rapidly deploy forces to um, shore up our, our allies defense and then how do we repel a, an invasion or an attack and so you had to understand the different functions and components that would be arrayed against you and how best to counter them and where to deploy those forces our second mission was the NATO mission, uh, preparing the defense against an invasion by Russia. So then you're talking a whole different ballgame because now you're talking about very large army formations, you know, tank armies, different multiple divisions. How do we best uh, deploy and repel against those? Do you give time for space? Do you find a couple spots where you're legitimately going to hunker down and fight it out? Uh, because there's a lot involved because you have to go from having your immediate forces on hand to now how in the heck do I get more forces deployed over? How fast do I get them moved over? What resources do I have to move them? You know, because part of it, it may come down to uh, commandeering United Air, United Airlines aircraft to transport the troops over, uh, working with FedEx and UPS to do the airlift for moving munitions over uh, and then using um Merchant Marines in, uh, you know, believe it or not, like uh, car carriers, those roll-on, roll-off car carriers, mm -hmm. to de rapidly deploy uh, armored vehicles and, and and tanks over. So you got to understand this massive logistic chain. So nothing irks me more when I read a military thriller, and someone says, "Okay, they've done this massive invasion," and then in like another chapter or two, with no explanation, there's like this two hundred thousand man army of U.S. soldiers that have managed to move seven or 8,000 miles and they're ready to fight. It's like, well, that's not realistic. That doesn't happen that quickly. Where, well, how did you go from point A to point C? What happened to point B? And we're really detailed in how we get along those different lines like that. And a lot of our readers love that stuff. They, they like being able to see that minutia, that detail. How do you do that? How do you incorporate this? How do you handle the, the cyber hacking? Because when an, when an attack happens like that, you can bet the Russians or whoever you're fighting, as well as us, are going to be getting into those logistic systems, hacking into there, rerouting units, rerouting this, changing orders, not make, you know making sure that this supply part doesn't get there. Uh, lots of little chaos and, hate and and stuff that happens. It's like what you saw with the Battle of the Bulge, where you had German officers and, and you know wearing American uniforms, and then they would direct a battalion or, or a company of tanks to the wrong area. You know, well, that is, has changed. So it's not people on the ground doing it. It's now ones and zeros and computer programs doing it. And so a lot of authors don't incorporate that kind of stuff or put that in. Or, you know, I've read some books where they'll have a, you know, an, an EMP gets detonated over the country and they'll have this big fight. But all of a sudden the EMP is hit, but it doesn't have any effect on the military. It doesn't have any effect on the civilian economy. It's like, are you serious? I mean, come on. You just detonated an EMP over half the United States. The logistics is going to be totally screwed up. There's going to be no fuel. You know, riots in the street. People are going to be hungry and starving within days. You're not going to be able to fight anything. You're going to be completely on just trying to keep everyone alive. And if you want so, to, if you, if you want to know for certain that this stuff is is important, read a history book about the Second World War. You mentioned the Battle of the Bulge, but so many of those big battles failed or were successful because Logistics. they got people in the right place at the right time and if you run out of toilet roll or if you run out of food it doesn't matter how good your tanks are you know or where you know it does it does come down to that and i used to do my defense reporting seeing the c141s in my day taking off yep. from our local base in an air bridge you know every sort of half an hour another one would go and i yep. remember on a live tv broadcast someone said we you know what sort of things are they holding and i said they're toilet roll you know, it's, it's it's the stuff you need to move a large number of people from one place well, to another. When you look at when you look at World War Two, World War Two is an exceptional case study because it was large armies versus large armies. So you got to see that full thing on on unveiled right there. So the German army, when they're invading Stalingrad and Leningrad area, they didn't get defeated because they were an inferior force. They got defeated because of logistics. The German army was un unable to supply their soldiers with the proper types of winter gear to keep them furnished. 
Then they made the mistake of saying, well, let's go inside of city instead of bypassing it and finding the army and destroying the army. Again, just you can see case and points of failures. And then you look at D-Day and the success of D-Day wasn't because we were able to land so many troops and because we were able to get so many people there. The success of D-Day was because we had established a massive logistical train and they were able to get these, these artificial harbors built to be able to keep the resources pouring in faster than the Germans could, could take them out. That's, that was the crux of how they won. It really was a logistics war. And because we were able to master that and move people to the right places, right time, constantly keep them in there, that's how you win. But wars of the future are going to be very similar, same way. I remember when I was in, uh, in Baghdad in 2007, you know, they, were, they were hitting our convoys left and right with IEDs. Well, our convoys is how we get most of our food delivered, okay? Mm-hmm. From Kuwait, they drive them up, they deliver our food. Well, we had a couple, we had a couple strings of convoys that get that got nailed. Well, you know, in short order, our base legitimately ran out of food because you know you're feeding, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 people on a base. Um, that's a lot of food when you have to do four meals a day. So they only have like three to four days worth of food. But when we had a couple of days of interrupted convoys, we were eating MREs. For, you know three or four days until they got caught back up again so it was yeah. a good case in point a reminder that this is still important even in the modern day yeah you and i could anorak about this for quite a long time so i have to be wary but last point i'm going to make is people often look at the dam busters and there's been a lot in recent years there's been lots of was this for show was this a pr stunt did it have any genuine mm-hmm. impact because they rebuilt dams fairly quickly but actually somebody a guy called james holland in the uk a history writer did some research on this and he worked out that the logistics effort that was taken away from the Normandy defences to yep. rebuild the dams it's had a, a direct impact on how successful D-Day was. Yeah, um, it was the cement. Was, it was the yeah. cement. And nobody thinks about cement yeah. as being yeah, exactly, important. Yeah. It was actually very important. Well, you're clearly down in the weeds with your books. I'd, I'd encourage people to have a look at uh, a James. Is it Rossoni or Rossone? How do you pronounce your Rossone. Rossone, yeah. okay. James Rossone and Miranda Watson on Amazon. Fantastic set of covers. Um and what a brilliant job you've done, James. So uh, so pleased to have you as part of our community. And, and I can it's no surprise to me listening to the way that you're organized, your work ethic. I think they're two big ingredients for success. Yeah, and you know, you've got to be you got to be open to criticism. You got to develop uh, a good set of author friends, a good set of beta readers that could just be brutally honest and say, "Dude, this thing sucks. You got to fix this." Or, "Hey, let's do a different book cover because this isn't going to cut it and this isn't going to work." And you got to be able to accept that. You got to realize this isn't personal about you. This is about the product. And as long as you can separate that, it's okay. And that's hard. I'll tell you, I've gotten some blistering one-star reviews of like, I got one, I got two one-star reviews back to back. One was saying that this was a right-wing propaganda. Another one said that this was left-wing propaganda. And I'm looking at this, I'm like, wow, here are two people who've seen this come from completely different perspectives. And they both wrote a simultaneous review like that. But I got to understand this isn't a critique of you as a person. This is just a critique or comment about a book you created. And that's hard as an author to separate. And I always tell my friends, you know, imagine going to work and throughout the whole day, people are writing an online review of you. That's what it's like to be an author. And I'll tell you, that's taken years to get over and, and, and not take that personal, but you've got to, you've yeah. got to separate the two. You've got to realize this is just about the book. It's not about you. They're not reviewing you as a person. They're just reviewing the book. <laughs> it's the product. It's the product. The trouble is that when you work in a car factory, you're one of a thousand people who've got, got together to build that car. So you don't take it too personally, but it's a book. It's you, you and your wife. And so, but you're absolutely you right. Your- treat, it, treat it as a product. Um, yeah. James, it's been fantastic chatting to you. I want to say, first of all, thank you for your service. You, uh, you went above and beyond, I think, even for what we'd expect of a service person in this day and age, your personal commitment. And we also wish you the best with your own, I'm going to use the J word, your own journey since you've come back and uh, your own personal health. We take that very seriously as well. So uh, so thank you for talking to us and, and very best wishes. And thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me on. And again, you know, the Mark's course is incredible. You've got to take advantage of it. But the community that's involved in the SPF group, that is where there's a lot of value. Ask questions, find people who can mentor you and help you along the way. It's really important is finding some good mentors that'll help you and just constantly asking questions and test, test, test. 
This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. So that's James uh, Rossone, uh, who's uh, active in the groups. And uh, yeah, well, well done to James for finding a second career with uh, such gusto. And another husband-wife team there, mm. Mark. It is, it is a secret weapon in our, our business, isn't it? Yeah, there are more and more that I can think of um, who are either doing that or moving in that direction, which is is pretty cool, I think. I mean, it, I, it had crossed my mind to do something like that at the uh, live show, is to have um, a couple of, I mean, like, I think I think Lucy Score is coming, isn't she? Am I right? Yes. yes Lucy and Tim, Lucy I think, and are Tim. coming. Yeah. But that would be quite interesting. Just, I, I think it's it's interesting, those kinds of dynamics as to how husbands and wives can work together in that way because it's not easy um no you know we, it's, it's not it's, for everyone that's for sure it's definitely not for everyone um lots of other issues that you need to ne- negotiate when when you try to do something like that but it would, would have been quite interesting but no it, it's um it's great to see james um you know expanding or building a family business yeah yeah definitely um and i spoke to um L this week, whose surname escapes me for the moment, Thorpe, L Thorpe, who is one of our SPF Foundation uh, awardees from a couple of years ago, who has really broken through and uh, is doing really well. So we, we caught up with her this week, and she's another husband and wife. Is she doing well? Writer. She's doing really well. Oh, that's doing good. Really great. Well, well, it's funny you should say that. because Puts it all down to the foundation, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Well, that's great, because I've actually just... I picked my, we, we basically, Lucy runs the foundation for us, my wife, Lucy, and she um, selected 12 authors. I don't know how many we had. We had a good, a fairly good number of applications this year with 12 authors um, that she shortlisted. And then uh, me and Ricardo from Reedsy, who Reedsy also sponsored the foundation, we rank them um, from one to 12 in, in order of our preference. So I did mine over the weekend. Ricardo has just actually sent his three this afternoon. So Lucy will now sit down and work out uh, the, the how to allocate the points. So there's a couple of good yeah, authors um, this year. So, I mean, hopefully we'll see some um, someone replicating what Elle's done. And I'm, I, I didn't know that she was a foundation winner. So that's that's great to hear. Yeah, no, she's done she's done really well. And she's reti- her husband works very hard. He has two jobs, but she's retiring him from one of them. So we should say, for those who don't know, the foundation is we, we basically give some money, quite a lot of money actually, to, to um, I can't remember how many, it's more more than a couple, three or four uh, winners. We, I get around about $2,500, three. Three, three winners, is it? yeah, three or four, two and a half thousand dollars, I think it is, um, and, and both of our courses. And, um, and it's for people who can't, otherwise might struggle to self-publish because they perhaps they can't get the money together for a pro cover or they can't get the money together for an edit and so what we do is we give them a little bit of a helping hand and we i'm you know if, if Elle is attributing her success to that little bit of momentum that we gave her a couple of years ago then that makes me very pleased and i'll certainly tell yeah. this because i don't think she knows that yeah she does no, that that interview is is coming up um, so we start again this year. I'm afraid it's going to be 12 months before we do the next set of awards. Um, but if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPF dash foundation, or just go to our website, selfpublishingformula.com and click on uh, SPF foundation, you will see the details. Um, and we could perhaps review that, you know, like inflation and everything. Maybe we need to go up to $3,000 now. Well, I, um, I know that um, Publish Drive are quite interested in sponsoring that as well. So um, They are. We, you we know, can... Do you know what? And I dare say the other organizations who we talk to a lot, um, who every time we've ever said, would you like to come on board with something, have fallen over themselves to do so. And I'm sure that some of those, I won't name, name their names because just in case they won't, but I imagine if we went to a couple of the other big names in our space, they would be very keen on, mm-hmm. on being a part of that. So we could expand that this year. Well, um, yep. uh, we'll have a look into that it's a great thing to do good okay well, look i think that is it um i think we've done enough rambling to uh to keep everyone satisfied well i think people who don't like the banter aren't listening after the interview they immediately log off to save their data so uh yeah we um we, we've basically anyone still listening they're, they're kind of the true fans so we can this is where all the yeah. good stuff this is where the good this stuff happens good. we should give give away money now shouldn't we okay look we'll try and do our review uh, episode next week if we can uh, mark if we can find the time ooh, ooh. Um, one thing i we've got to mention we're going to run out of time but uh, maybe we'll do it next week we, there's a couple more people announce the uh, the live show but we can do that yes we'll Let's do, do that, that next, next week. week yeah we've got uh, we might even have a couple more to add to it mm-hmm. by then so that'll be a whole episode of banter the whole 40 minutes will be banter. it is th- it's the dream. That's um, I, we, we're, weirdly enough, those are the episodes that always do best. So uh, you know, yeah, in terms are. of our downloads, people like that the best. So you know, 
Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you so much indeed for listening. Uh, It only leaves me to say that it's a goodbye from him. And cheerio from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.